Well, good evening, Guildford Home Groups. It would be lovely to be with you in person this evening, but my current parish duties in South Wales rather tie me up on a Thursday evenings, so instead I'm choosing to be with you virtually. I've pre-recorded this presentation partly in case the link becomes poor and partly so I can give you a better combination of uh, video and graphics, but uh, I will be with you live at the end of the presentation for a question and answer session. I've been asked to speak to you this evening about gifts and charisms because I understand you've recently been examining your own personal gifts using the tools provided by many gifts ministries. I'm going to start with basics and look at where gifts and charisms feature in scripture, in the history of the church and in the current teaching of the church and then look at how we use them in practice in the church. So I'm going to start with the word gift itself. The word is a very simple English word. It means something given. And you can find that word going all the way back for a thousand years and more to the Proto-Germanic root, a gift is something given. So in its natural sense, it means a present, something that I hand from me to you. But it's also always been used to describe an ability or a talent that a person has because of that deep cultural understanding we've always had in the Christian West that abilities and talents are not just from me, they're something literally given by God. And if God has given them to us, that makes them a gift. Then we have the word charism, and we use the word charisms because it's a Greek word which also means something given, perhaps with a slightly more nuanced sense of given as a grace or favour. It first came into English in the 20th century in the form of the word charisma, which meant a very particular gift, the ability to charm someone. And so outside the Christian context, if you say someone's charismatic, you mean it's a person who'll light up a room and draw people to themselves. But in our Christian context, we've gone back and looked again at how the word charism is used in Greek in the Bible. And we use it in our context to mean gifts that are clearly given by God. And because it's a Greek word, there are a couple of ways of making the plural. Treating it as an English word, we might speak of charisms. Sometimes someone who's more of a classical Greek scholar will speak of one charism or one charisma and many charismata. It's the same thing, someone's just showing off by using language, and that's their gift. Another word worth checking in on is talents. Now, a talent was an ancient Greek word for a particular amount of money. The scholars argue about just how many silver pieces were involved, but that's not really relevant to us. If we know our Bible, we'll understand the word talent from Jesus teaching the parable of the talents, where servants are entrusted with different quantities of money to invest. But of course, because that parable has had a strong cultural influence on the Christian West, we've come to use the word talent to mean the ability to do something. The servants went out, invested their talents and were rewarded or condemned as a result. Can we say in any regard that these gifts, charisms or talents are supernatural? There's a famous saying you'll often hear church scholars use, which is that grace perfects nature. And that's a saying, or at least a summary of a saying, from no less an authority than the great St Thomas Aquinas. You'll find it there at that reference to the Summa Theologiae. But a rather more user-friendly summary of it comes from the blogger Connie Rossini, who described it like this. God works with our intellect and our will, raising them up to a level they could never reach on their own. And this is a particular teaching about human beings. We human beings need grace because God has given us free will. We're made in God's image, but we can only perfectly live out that image with God's help. We're not meant to do it on our own. We're meant to be members of the body of Christ. And so we can only be perfectly what we're called to be if we open ourselves to the workings of grace. Among the charisms we're going to talk about, some are labelled ordinary and others extraordinary. And the ordinary ones at first sight, don't seem to need any help from God. Pop psychology understands a lot about people having natural gifts and how they can be used to the utmost. You might hear the expression that a sports person is in the zone, 
or a creative person is in the flow. These words have very similar but not quite overlapping senses, but they both refer to a state of mind where a person is very focused to the point that they tune out what else is going on in the world, that they're doing a process which they've done so often it's become instinctive, and they're drawing on skills. Now, skills are things we can learn and perfect by doing regularly, but this is using the skill in the best possible way, maxing out your ability, totally focused, not distracted by anything. It's become second nature. And then the athlete or the creative person might say, I was really in the zone. I was in the flow. Look at how I performed and what I came up with. So yes, our human minds have some amazing abilities and we can do certain things to a high degree in our own strength, or at least without being conscious of any help from God. But if we're Christians, if we're people who pray, why stop there? Why not seek God's help to be the very best that we can be? Maybe something of this was known by the Christian and Olympic athlete Eric Liddell, the star of the famous movie Chariots of Fire, who once said, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. That's more than being in the zone or being in the flow. It's something about sensing God's grace enhancing something that's a natural ability or maybe even just God rejoicing in a purely natural ability that of being a great athlete. We speak of even these ordinary gifts as being charisms, gifts given by God, because they can all be enhanced by grace. So things like teaching, administration, crafting, if you can really draw in a class and they listen to you with attention and are blessed by what you're saying. If you're running a project in a way that respects people and encourages them and get things done efficiently and everyone's happy. If you can make something beautiful in a way that lets the glory of God shine through. It's pretty difficult to tease out how much of that was you and how much of that was the Holy Spirit putting a little polish on what you're doing. But shouldn't we want to be the best that we can be with God's help? And to do it, not for the sake of our glory, but for God's glory. That's what makes these things that the world would regard as perfectly worldly skills and talents, charisms, ordinary charisms, but God-given gifts nevertheless. And then there are the extraordinary charisms. I'm talking about things which would be totally impossible without God's help, but which become possible when a person surrenders to the Holy Spirit and lets God's power flow through them. That would include having prophetic knowledge about a future event or the state of a person's heart. It would include being able to minister healing to someone that had an immediate or quick effect. And it would include working visible miracles. When we look at the Old Testament, we don't see a lot of evidence for extraordinary charisms. We're told explicitly that there were not many prophets. Indeed, in 1 Samuel, we're told that in the days the boy Samuel was called, prophecy was rare. There are relatively few accounts of healings and raising the dead, although we do find them in the accounts of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. But largely, the Old Testament is the story of God's covenant with Israel, how God promises to protect them if they're faithful to the law and warns them that they will not enjoy security if they don't follow the law but instead worship foreign gods. But among the prophets of the Old Testament, we do find a text that encourages us to expect something more. In the prophet Joel, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. It's a prophecy of a future coming. And it's one that comes very close in the days that our Lord Jesus walks the earth. For at the end of St. Mark's Gospel, almost his final words, these are spoken after the resurrection, as a commission to his followers, our Lord himself says, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now those are listed as signs because they're dramatic. 
They're not all charisms. Three of them are. Any Christian has authority to command demons to leave, but that can be enhanced by the charism of discernment of spirits. Healing, of course, is a charism, as is praying in tongues. On the other hand, well, picking up serpents or drinking poison without deadly effect might be very particular gifts given to you if you need them, but I'm not proposing that uh, the Guildford Home Groups suddenly start a snake handling or a poison tasting club to develop those charisms. Those are signs that God gives you when you need them urgently to get out of a difficult situation, as Paul did on the island of Malta. The prophecy of Joel is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, at least our Christian Pentecost. The original Pentecost was a Jewish harvest festival celebrated every year. But on that particular Pentecost, 50 days after the Lord rose from the dead, the apostles were gathered preaching in the public square and they were anointed by tongues of fire that came down from heaven and a miracle allowed the people there of different races and tongues to instantaneously understand whatever it was that St. Peter was saying. And Peter immediately understood that what they were witnessing there was the fulfilment of the prophecy of Joel, and he says so. But what happens on the day of Pentecost is not a good template for how charisms continue to work in the church afterwards. It was more of a dramatic kickstart for the church. What we do find happens as the more normal Christian experience is also recorded in the book of Acts. And these are the things that the book says are the signs of the Holy Spirit at work. So in chapter 8 verse 17, Philip's preaching to a group of Samaritans and then a couple of apostles come and lay hands on them and we're told they received the Holy Spirit. We're not told what the sign was, but we can intuit that probably they prayed in tongues or they prophesied in order for this to be asserted. It's made more clear in Acts chapter 10, verse 46, where Peter is preaching in the household of Cornelius, the Roman soldier, and his entourage, and we're told that even as Peter was preaching, and even before he'd got round to baptising them, thank you very much, with water, Cornelius and his companions start manifesting tongues and extolling God. And Peter says, well, there's no argument now. Clearly, I have to baptise them. God has shown them fit for his gifts. In chapter 19, verse 6, again, the apostles are preaching in Ephesus, and when they lay their hands on the new converts, they pray in tongues and they prophesy. So these things become the common experience in Acts of the Holy Spirit at work. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, St. Paul gives examples of the charisms that he knows operate in the church, and clearly, particularly in the church at Corinth. There are gifts of wisdom and knowledge. There are gifts, plural, of healing. The fact Paul says it in the plural is important, and we'll come back to that. And we're told there were gifts of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing different kinds of spirits, gifts of tongues, and interpreting the meaning of tongues. Now, when the Bible gives you a list like that, is it being illustrative or prescriptive? Is it offering you a window or a box? A window is a way of looking at something. And if you shift your gaze, you can see a little bit more that way or that way. A window offers you insight. Whereas if you put something in a box, it has hard edges and things are either inside the box or outside the box. And it's my firm belief that when the Bible offers us a list of something like this, the Bible is not seeking to give an exhaustive and exact list of gifts. Rather, it's helping us to understand things by giving us some windows and saying, this is how the Holy Spirit can work. Remember, the Holy Spirit is creative. The Spirit blows where it wills. I think it would be very dangerous to say that what's already in the Bible is an exhaustive description of how the Spirit can work. The Bible is exhaustive in explaining everything we need to know to get to heaven. But... As John says at the end of his gospel, if everything Jesus did were written down, all the books of the world couldn't hold them. And how much more so for the work of the Spirit through the many millions of believers. So let's come back to the fact that Paul mentions gifts of healings. When you see the ways that different people with gifts of healings work in the church, there are different styles. I've heard many testimonies of healing by preaching. Someone's proclaiming the word of God and a healing is worked and the listeners as their hearts respond to that. 
There are those who have the gift of healing by the laying on of hands. They minister individually to a person and something happens. And there's healing by the prophetic word. Someone receives a word in their heart. Oh, there's a lady here with a green cardigan with a pain in her knee. And um, when that is called out, faith is stirred up by the woman who knows that God is ministering to her right now. And that provokes the faith that's needed to receive the healing. There may be other styles as well. These are only examples. Remember, windows, not boxes. In 1 Corinthians 12, St. Paul mentions several gifts which work by revelation. So he talks about a gift of knowledge. Well, clearly that's knowing something. He talks about a gift of wisdom. Well, that's knowing something as well, but wisdom is a how-to gift. It's the difference between knowing what and knowing how. Then he speaks about the discernment of spirits. Well, that's a very particular kind of knowledge, knowing what spirit, the name of an evil spirit, or whether it's just a human condition, or whether it's God's prompting at work in the heart of a human being. And after all that list, Paul also says there is prophecy. And Christians can get tied up in knots arguing on the fine difference between knowledge, wisdom and prophecy. We know scripture says prophecy is that which edifies, which builds up and encourages a person. But if we think of these as windows, not boxes, it doesn't really matter where they overlap and how you fit the cutoff. Paul is just giving examples of what the Holy Spirit can do. Remember. We're looking through windows. We're not putting gifts into boxes. Now, there are other gifts mentioned in the Bible. You may not be familiar with the term motivational gifts, but this comes from a book by Andy Rain from the Northumbria community who wrote his book called Given for Life. And this is based on Romans 12, verses 6 to 8. Here, Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, again speaks of charisms, but here he gives a rather different list. It says, some have the gift of being prophets and others of being teachers. Some have the gifts of organizing or ruling the community. Some have the gift of encouraging or exhorting people in their Christian journey. Some have the gift of caring or showing mercy to people. Different translations will render it in different ways. Some have the gift of being a helper or a servant, getting on with the practical needs of the community and some have a great heart for giving of their financial ability. Now you can read more about motivational gifts in Andy Rain's book, but I wanted to share that with you just to show you that elsewhere in the Bible, St. Paul gives another list of what he calls charisms, and it's not the same thing. So again, think windows, not boxes. There's also a list in scripture of what we might call positional gifts, and you'll find this in Ephesians 4.11. And although some Bible translations will say, and to some their gift was this, and to some their gift was that, this passage is not using the word charism. It's using a different Greek word, edokan. And here it says some have the gift of being apostles, network builders, building up the wider church. Some have the gift of being a prophet. Some have the gift of being an evangelist, which means someone who preaches with conviction and wins hearts for Christ. And some he made shepherds or pastors and teachers. And the scholars argue about whether shepherd and teacher is a single category because the person who guides the community needs to be able to teach it or whether it's teasing out two different gifts. But these are positional gifts. Think of them as positions to which a person might be appointed because we would say that a public rule is in the gift of the person in authority who hands out things. And that's why sometimes you'll hear teaching about the office of prophet as opposed to the gift of prophet. An individual might occasionally prophesy in a prayer group, but someone with a recognized gift of receiving accurate prophecy might be recognized in the wider church community as someone you go to to get advice from God and would be said to have the office of prophet. Similarly, if God calls them to go and speak to rulers of nations and to leaders in other contexts, that would be the sign that someone had the office of prophet and not just a ministry of it. So that's the theory of what we see happening in the days of the New Testament. But what happens as the church grows and tries to live this out? Well, we have some evidence from the early church. There's a document called the Didache, the teaching of how to live as Christians, 
written around the year 100, and it clearly attests that there were prophets in the local community. In the year 162 or thereabouts, St. Justin the Martyr, in his writings, comments that gifts of prophecy exist among us. In the year 200, Irenaeus, writing somewhere in France, mentions that there are brothers who possess prophetic gifts. In the year 313, Christianity comes out of the shadows. The Emperor Constantine passes the Edict of Milan and Christianity is decriminalised in the Roman Empire, which is where most of the Christians in the world still are. You can understand that as an underground movement risking death and many persecutions, most of the believers would be fairly fervent and have a great openness to the gifts of the Spirit. But now the church comes out of the shadows and that leads to a great dilution, the more so a few years later when it becomes the official state religion of the Roman Empire and now very many career clergy are needed to run the public churches. And so there will be a number of uh, Christian leaders who perhaps are not entering the ministry for the right reasons. It might be about power, status and authority and not about deep discipleship and surrender to Christ. Whatever the full reasons behind it, just over a century later, St. Augustine of Hippo, writing in 426, says that there are no more tongues. The charismatic gifts have died out in a century of the church being an open public and official religion. Now that's not to say that prophecy and healing are totally disappeared from the church. I've just put a few names on the screen here of people from different ages. You can see the dates there trekking through two millennia of Christian history. These are all people who had prophetic gifts of being able to read hearts, of know what was on people's minds. And so God has always blessed his church with a handful of wonder workers through whom the Holy Spirit is at work. But the prophecy of Joel founded. It wasn't a case that God would visibly pour out his spirit on the whole church. Now, there were merely some outstanding Christian examples where God's grace was freely flowing. This changed in the 20th century. On the very first day of that century, Pope Leo XIII sang the hymn Veni Creato Spiritus, Come Holy Spirit, and he made a very deliberate act of consecrating the 20th century to the Holy Spirit. The prayers of popes can be answered in interesting ways. It was just a few hours later, at 11pm local time in Topeka, Kansas, a lady called Agnes Osman prays in tongues. There's a group of Protestant Christians who've been studying the Acts of the Apostles, praying for those gifts to be stirred up, and it happens to Agnes. Two days later, after several other members of the same fellowship received similar gifts, they suddenly experience an outpouring where the whole congregation, or at least many among them, are harmonising in tongues. They've never heard group singing in tongues before, and the Holy Spirit comes and creates the harmony. If you've ever heard that yourself, you'll know how beautiful that can be. Now, some would say the Topeka a revival wasn't the first modern outpouring of tongues. There are reports of another small church that had it in 1896. Others point to the Azusa Street revival of 1906 as the real birth of the Pentecostal churches. But clearly, around this time at the turn of the 20th century, there are Protestant Christians opening their hearts to the Holy Spirit and experiencing an outpouring of gifts in a way that hasn't been known since the late 300s. As often happens when new things happen in Christian contexts, the leaders of the traditional Protestant churches shook their heads and said, that's strange, that's not how we do things here. And the Pentecostal Christians were forced to break away and set up their own Pentecostal churches. And so for the first 60 years of the 20th century, that's where we'd find the gifts of the Spirit at work. It was in the year 1960 that the Anglican Church began to experience outpourings of the Holy Spirit. And in the following year, Pope St. John XXIII was inspired to get the whole church praying a prayer, which I won't quote now in its fullness, but said, Come, Lord, renew your wonders in this our day as by a new Pentecost. That same spirit that stirred Leo XIII to dedicate the century to the Holy Spirit stirred John XXIII to call on the whole church to pray with an open heart for something to happen. 
Of course, what John XXIII then did was call the Second Vatican Council, summoning the world's bishops to come to Rome and review everything that we teach as a Catholic Church. And after three years of deliberation, and with a change of Pope, because John XXIII died after the first session, and Paul VI became Pope, the third October session of Vatican II started writing the first formal documents published by Vatican II. And the one I'm going to quote from first is one of the big ones. Lumen gentium, the light of the nations, is what we call a dogmatic constitution. There were four constitutions from Vatican II, and between them they set out, this is who we are as a church, this is what we do. One of them was a constitution on liturgy, just called a constitution, it says, okay, this is how, under the authority of the bishops, we choose to worship. One of them was called a pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, on the church in the modern world. The world is always shifting, so we always have to be updating how we apply timeless principles of Christian morality to a changing world. And so it's a pastoral constitution where the church takes the principles and says, as the world is now, this is how we think they apply. But the other two constitutions were dogmatic constitutions, and in these, our church's leaders set out firmly, we, as all the bishops of the church, in union with the Pope, we are stating clearly, this is dogma. This is what we have received from God. This is what we believe as members of the Catholic Church. And there were two dogmatic constitutions. One, De Verbum, was about scripture and said, this is how we believe God has spoken to us through scripture and through tradition. And the other, Lumen Gentium, was about the church. It said, this is what we believe God has called the church to be. So you don't get a more authoritative statement of Catholic teaching than what I'm going to show you next. It's a dogmatic constitution. It's our bishops saying, this is what the Catholic Church believes. From chapter 12, charisms, whether they be the more outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation for they are perfectly suited to and useful for the needs of the church. Extraordinary gifts are not to be sought after, nor are the fruits of apostolic labour to be presumptuously expected from their use. Now remember, this is 1964. Charismatic renewal has not yet come to the Catholic Church. While there have always been a handful of wonder-working saints, widespread charisms haven't been experienced by Catholics since the 300s, though they've been experienced in the Pentecostal churches for the last 60 years. But the bishops, speaking in the name of the church, say charisms are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation. Thank you, Lord, that you've given gifts to your church. And Lord, we are happy and pleased and comforted because we need these gifts for the church. There's a warning here, extraordinary gifts are not to be sought after. This is probably drawn from the teaching of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, who warn against being too drawn to just ask for extraordinary gifts myself, because pride can come in that way. Oh, look at me, I've got a spiritual gift. But it is in tension with what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, where he says, eagerly desire the greater gifts, especially that you may prophesy. They don't seek after gifts, but do desire them. That's quite a sensitive balance to have to live out. And the church goes on to say, nor are the fruits of apostolic labour to be presumptuously expected from their use. So just because I pray in tongues, or just because I can prophesy, that doesn't mean I'm going to be a great evangelist and a revival is going to follow from me being open to God. It might, if I use my gifts in a way that's open to God's leading, anything could happen. But the mere fact that I have a spiritual gift, that I manifest a charism, isn't automatically going to transform the church around me. That's sobering. Now the Second Vatican Council didn't stop there. The four main documents were constitutions, but it also produced 12 other documents, several of them called decrees, that zone in on different areas of church life and enhance what's already been said in the constitutions. So the following year, in 1965, which was the fourth and final session of Vatican II, the bishops pass the decree on the apostolate of the laity, which is generally known by its Latin name, Apostolicum Actuositatum. 
and this has more to say about charisms. Mostly you'll find it in paragraph 3. The laity derive the right and duty to the apostolate from their union with Christ the head, incorporated into Christ's mystical body through baptism and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit through confirmation, they are assigned to the apostolate by the Lord himself. To put this another way, as Pope Francis did when he was newly elected, he said, look, because of our baptism, we're all called to be missionary disciples. If we're baptised, we have both the right to spread the message of Jesus and the duty to tell people about him and invite them to follow him. And that's why we're given the power of the Holy Spirit through confirmation, so we can do things like this. The laity are called not only that they may offer spiritual sacrifices in everything they do, so that's our prayers at Mass and how we might make a morning offering to unite our joys and sorrows to Christ, but also so that they may witness to Christ throughout the world. Again, it's back to we're called to be missionaries' disciples. On all Christians, therefore, is laid the preeminent responsibility of working to make the divine message of salvation known and accepted by all men, today we translate that as all people, throughout the world. How do we do this? Well, the Holy Spirit gives the faithful special gifts also. And from the acceptance of these charisms, including those which are more elementary, there arise for each believer the right and duty to use them in the church and in the world for the good of men, you can insert, and of women, and the building up of the church in the freedom of the Holy Spirit who breathes where he wills. There's a lot in that. And remember, charismatic renewal hasn't happened in the Catholic Church yet. But our bishops are already teaching that if you should be given a spiritual gift, you have both the right and the duty to use it. There are two places you're called to use them, in the church and in the world. Your gifts can be used to bless those who are already following Christ and worshipping, and they can also be used with people who aren't yet connected to the church, but whom God loves and wants to draw into his body. This should be done by the laity in communion with their brothers in Christ, especially with their pastors who must make a judgment about the true nature and proper use of these gifts, not to extinguish the Spirit, but to test all things and hold for what is good. Now this is interesting language. It's not entirely clear what he means by it's not entirely clear what they mean by in communion with their brothers in Christ. From Vatican II, that language was often used to imply members of other Christian denominations. Is it talking about Catholics collaborating with charismatic Christians and other traditions? That's one way of reading it. It could simply also mean other members of your local congregation who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And of course, it does say, let the parish priest be the judge of what's appropriate. The pastors, the parish priests and the bishops must discern how these gifts are meant to be used. There's another paragraph in Apostolicum Actuositatum, which is paragraph 30, which may be particularly relevant to us tonight because it talks about lay groups and associations, and that can include something like home groups. So those groups dedicated to the apostolate or to other supernatural goals, that would include things like prayer, should, should carefully and assiduously promote formation for the apostolate in keeping with their purpose and condition. Their members meet in small groups with their associates or friends, examine the methods and results of their apostolic activity and compare their daily way of life with the gospel. So this is suggesting that when you meet in home groups, you should say to each other, How's it going as you try to share the Christian faith with people who aren't yet Christians? And how are you doing at living out the standards of the gospel in your daily life? These are two fantastic things to do when you have Christian fellowship around you. The church goes on to say that the whole lay apostolate, which must be carried on not only among the organised groups themselves, but also in all circumstances throughout one's whole life, especially one's professional and social life, Indeed, everyone should diligently prepare himself, herself, for the apostolate, this preparation being the more urgent in adulthood. So you don't just use your charisms or speak about your faith when you're at home group. You are God's ambassador. 
you are out there in the world, in your workplace, at the school gate, in your old age pensioners club, wherever you meet other people, you are called to bring Christ and to invite people to know Christ. And if you don't know how to do that, the church says you have an urgent need to get yourself trained on how to do it. We're very good at training children for the sacraments, but for adults there's an even more urgent need to learn how to spread the faith. For the advance of age brings with it a more open mind, enabling each person to detect more readily the talents with which God has enriched his or her soul, and to exercise more effectively those charisms which the Holy Spirit has bestowed on him or on her for the good of the community. And that's what you're doing right now by revising what your gifts are, having another look at yourself in a spiritual mirror. You're asking as adults, what gifts has God given me and how am I being called to use them? So back to the history of the 20th century. And in 1967, Catholics begin to manifest tongues and other spiritual gifts at Duquesne University in the USA. There's a group of students who are making a retreat studying the Book of Acts, and they are the first known Catholics in modern times to manifest these gifts. But then it spreads like wildfire, and it's not directly that the Duquesne students met others and laid hands on them and prayed for them. Well, that would be true in a few cases. It was more that God had decided that the time had come and the floodgates of heaven would be open, and many Catholic groups are touched by tongues and prophecy and healing within the next few years, so that charismatic renewal becomes a great tide in the church. Four years later, and again four years after that, Pope Paul VI speaks in affirming ways of what he sees the Holy Spirit doing, and indeed in 1975 he says, yes, this renewal in the Spirit is a chance for the church. So 21 years after the beginning of Catholic renewal, there's a big Vatican meeting, the Synod on the laity, and as usually happens after a synod, the Pope, which by then is St. John Paul II, writes a document known as a post-synodal apostolic exhortation. And this one is known generally as Christofidelis Laity, Christ's Faithful Laity, which I'm sure you'll agree is preferable to the alternative title, On the Vocation and the Mission of the Lay Faithful in the Church and in the World. But it does exactly what it says on the tin. And this document, by a Pope and a saint, has a whole section devoted to charisms. You'll find most of it in paragraph 24. Whether they be exceptional and great, or simple and ordinary, the charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit that have, directly or indirectly, a usefulness for the ecclesial community, ordered as they are to the building up of the church, to the well-being of humanity, and to the needs of the world. There is no lack of a fruitful manifestation of various charisms among the faithful. Now, you couldn't have written that 20 years earlier, but they are manifested among women and men. These charisms are given to individual persons and can even be shared by others in such ways as to continue in time a precious and effective heritage. Probably the church is there commenting on people with gifts, laying on hands and praying for other people to receive similar gifts and these serve as a source of a particular spiritual affinity among persons. The gifts of the Spirit demand that those who have received them exercise them for the growth of the whole church. So we're back to the right and duty that was first spelled out in Apostolicum Actuositatum. The charisms are received in gratitude, both on the part of the one who receives them, and also on the part of the entire church. And that's interesting. When did you last hear your parish priest offering a prayer of thanksgiving that charismatic gifts were present in the church at large? We're meant to receive them with thanksgiving. Do we do that? Both for what we've personally received and for what the global church has received? St. John Paul II, speaking in the name of all the bishops at the Synod, went on to say this. We are also aware of the power of sin and how it can disturb and confuse the life of the faithful and of the community. And for this reason, nor charism dispenses a person from reference and submission to the pastors of the church. And pastors means bishops at diocesan level, parish priests at parish level. So the fact you've been given a gift 
doesn't give you authority to override your parish priest and say, no, no, I've got a duty to use my gift. So even if you don't want me to, I'm going to go and pray with people in a certain way. The church does need to be regulated. But when priests try to control or suppress other people's gifts out of fear or a simple lack of knowledge of how to handle it, they are doing the church a disservice. So to recap, there have been more statements by popes since then, but we've covered the main official documents. The church recognises that charisms are real. They must be welcomed. And when they're given, they must be used. They must be used for the good of the church, so for those who already know Christ and who worship, and they must be used to spread the gospel out there in the world where people don't yet know the gospel. And those who have been touched by charisms must receive appropriate formation and pastoring. And that's why it's fantastic to be a member of something like a home group. How do we recognise charisms? I know that in your home groups you've been using the inventory from many parts ministries. Now remember, think windows, not boxes. You're not trying to define a charism in rigid ways but their list offers you 24 windows in looking at different kind of things that uh, the Holy Spirit can do in a person's soul. That division of 24 categories was taken directly from a course called Called and Gifted, which was devised by Sherry Weddle, the famous author of Forming Intentional Disciples. And the list of 24 covers both ordinary and extraordinary charisms. Some of the ways of recognising what gifts you've been given are self-reflection and questionnaires. Quite often it just needs someone to ask us the right questions to hold up a mirror to ourselves for us to see more clearly what we've already been given and what flows easily when we try to use it. But if you're in a home group, it's also possible that your gifts will be talent spotted by group leaders. And in Divine Renovation, the great Canadian movement spreading through the world, encouraging churches to become more missionary focused. They teach a model where new members will first do Alpha or a similar outreach course, then go back and be helpers on the next couple of Alpha courses and eventually graduate to more permanent small groups rather like the Guildford Home Groups. And they expect that it's within those small groups where they can become known and where the group leaders will spot what their gifts and talents are and will then refer them to be part of the appropriate ministries in the parish. So it's not that there's a questionnaire or the priest stands in the pulpit and says, help, I need six volunteers for something. Rather, your gifts are noticed and then you are encouraged to put your gifts in the place they can be most useful. The church has said we need to be formed in our charisms. And that's partly about developing skills. Remember, grace perfects nature. So if your charisms are in the area of music or craft or teaching or any other discipline where there are human skills involved, part of growing your charism is going on whatever secular courses are available to sharpen those skills. But because grace perfects nature, to allow God's grace to flow through us, we need to be people of prayer, we need to be going to confession regularly to deal with the effects of sin in our life so that grace can flow through us to its fullness. For those charisms that are more extraordinary, we need a safe place to practice. If you believe you have a healing gift or a prophetic gift, then a home group is a fantastic place to start. In a safe environment with people who trust you and know that you're just trying things out. You can tentatively share things that you think are prophetic words, but you're not sure. So you can begin to understand from your own experience how God's going to speak through you. And it's not just about speaking the words, it's about learning to be sensitive to the other person, knowing when a word has been given to you for you to speak out loud, and when it's something for you to hold in your heart and pray about, and knowing when you should share it with the other person with a third party present for everyone's protection. There are some good protocols for prayer ministry, which you can read about and follow. And it's important for anyone having a a ministry and extraordinary charisms to have some mechanism of accountability that could be being accountable to a parish priest or it could be to your home group leader and to that it's good to have a spiritual director as well 
the best guidance in ministering can be found in these publications. Well, it's the same publication, but two editions that come from the National Body for Charismatic Renewal, which used to be called ICRIS and has now been succeeded by Charis International. So the guidelines on prayers for healing set out best practice for healing ministry, and there's also good wisdom in there for ministering prophetic gifts. How should charisms be used in the church? Well, I remember from my seminary days that St. Joseph Skilford used to have prayer ministry available after Mass. That might be a good thing to bring back, but you have to have reliable prayer ministers. They may need to be DBS checked for safeguarding purposes, they do need to be accountable to someone in leadership, and they do need to be tried and tested both so that in terms of human gifts they can minister appropriately and in terms of spiritual gifts there's evidence that there's some charism at work there so it's not just saying a nice prayer with someone. You can put on healing services. The church doesn't want those confused with masses. A healing mass is mass with the anointing of the sick. A healing service is a gathering which is not mass but where prayers for healing take place possibly with the laying on of hands. Obviously there can be a space within the home groups for ministering the gifts that the members have to each other when you pray with each other. And if you're running a course like Alpha that has a Holy Spirit day, prayer ministry is an integral part of that. Perhaps the more challenging aspect is taking the charisms out to use in the world. Your own family is a good place to start when you're having prayer as a family. Be open to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to share a prophetic word or picture or to just lay on hands and pray for family members who need healing of mind or body and see what God's going to do. But always get their permission first. There's the other daily relationships we have, colleagues at work, at the school gate, at the different clubs, pensioners groups that we might go to. Now that's where you have to seek God's guidance to pick the right moment. Can I pray for you? Can I pray with you? Can I share with you a thought that came to me when I was praying about you? You don't have to eyeball them as an Old Testament prophet and say, I've got a message from heaven, thus saith the Lord. Well, if God tells you to do it that way, maybe you should. But in general, relax. And just, no, I was praying about you and a thought came to my mind, which I wondered if it was from God. Can I just tell you what happened? And who could be offended by that? They can always shrug it off as your imagination if it doesn't hit home. Some people do what's called treasure hunting. They say to God, now give me a picture in my mind of someone I'm going to meet today and a message for them. And when you spot that person, you go up and offer it to them. In the same way, some put a prayer chair in a public space with a sign saying free prayer, and they invite people to come. If you're going to try these more public ministries, it's important to be accountable to someone. It's easy for pride to creep in, or for us to just do something which isn't fitting, and it's a very strong protection to have someone else looking in on what we're doing and saying, that bit was good, that bit maybe you should revise because it didn't bless people in the way you were hoping. So yes, do use the gifts and take them out there. But through the home groups or through your parish priest or through some other formal ministry structure, always make sure that there's accountability and there are no lone wolf ministries. The last thing I'd like to share with you this evening is perhaps the greatest obstacle we face to using our charisms and that's our sense of imposter syndrome who am i that god should use me to minister to people especially with the more extraordinary gifts well, i've got news for you you're not worthy don't panic because jesus only uses unworthy servants last year i was on a pilgrimage in the footsteps of saint paul I was with a group of Catholics who were mostly from Chicago, and because it was an expensive package tour, thousands of pounds, the kind of pilgrims who were on the tour were mostly professionals, lawyers, doctors, engineers, architects, people who were successful in their field and who the world regards as leaders. But even they would feel somewhat cowed if their parish priest went up to them and said, would you read at mass? Would you be a minister of Holy Communion? Would you serve on the parish council? A switch seems to flip in us when we're doing things for God. And even when we know we're competent to do things in the world, we draw back from the thought we could do it in the church. And something arises up in us and says, I'm not worthy. So I'll share with you 
the one sermon I preached when I was with them. So I looked round the room and there was a bishop with us, Bishop Wall of the Diocese of Gallup, and there were three other priests and a deacon and about 80 lay pilgrims. And I said, I've got news for you folks. I'm going to start with the bishop. Bishop Wall, you're not worthy. How do I know that? Well, I know that if you were saying Mass on your own in your home diocese and you got to that point in the Eucharistic prayer where you have to name the, the Pope and the Bishop, you would have to say, we pray for Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant. For many times you say to God, I'm not worthy. And folks in the congregation, I know it would be very rude to insult people when you've only just met them, but I'm afraid you're not worthy either. And I know that because I was with you for Mass yesterday. And just before you took Holy Communion, you all said, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. In fact, there are only five worthy people here today. There are three other priests and a deacon. And if you've ever been to the ordination of a priest or a deacon, you'll know there's a certain point where the candidate is presented and the bishop ordaining will ask, do you find him to be worthy? And the rector or a representative of the parish will stand up and say, after consultation among the people of God, I testify that he has been found worthy. And the people cry out, thanks be to God. And of course, that's ridiculous, because if none of us are worthy to even receive Holy Communion, still less could any of us be worthy to stand at the altar and minister there. But of course, that's not what we're talking about. The word worthy has multiple meanings. Are any of us worthy to come into God's presence, to worship Jesus, to stand in his name? No, of course not. We are broken human beings. None of us by our own merits can claim to do that. But that's only one meaning of the word worthy. At the ordination, when they ask if the man has been found to be worthy, they're asking, has he undergone the training that's needed? Has he shown learning and aptitude and ability to do that role to the best of his human ability? And that's what the yes means when he's declared worthy. And there's a third meaning of the word worthy. What something is worth is what a person is willing to pay for it. And I know what each one of you is worth. You are worth every drop of the blood of Jesus. For he died on the cross so that you may be saved and go to heaven. That is how worthy you are. So Jesus only picks people who are unworthy to minister in his name to do things. All human beings are unworthy, but he loves you, he died for you, and he chose you. So next time your parish priest asks you to do a certain task, or the Holy Spirit stirs up your heart to use a certain gift, don't indulge in false humility and say, oh Lord, I couldn't possibly. No, out of all the unworthy people your parish priest or the Lord himself could have picked, they've picked you, so get on with it. Remember, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It's not about you, it's about God who loves the world and wants his love to flow through you and asks you to know that you're unworthy so that you don't get too big-headed about it. Now go, learn how to use God's gifts well, and set the world on fire.